Good morning, and welcome to What's New in Cab Rider 4. It's that time of year where we release our new update, and Cab Rider 4 is now available. I want to show you what uh, has changed in Cab Rider 4, and I'm going to start off by using this model that was created for Cab Rider 3. It was actually the frame and panel version of the Gracie Hopkins kitchen uh, in that was created for uh, Cab Rider Comprehensive 3. One of the things we did in Cab Rider 4 is we removed the restriction of changing the name of component uh, definition names with using Entity Info. In the past, if you used Entity Info to change a component definition name, you lost all the attributes and you had to reassign them. With Cab Rider 4, that's no longer the case. Because we save them in a very different, we save the attributes in a very different place. So one of the things we have to do right off the bat is if we're using a model that was not generated with Cab Rider 4, then we have to update it. And it's an easy thing to do. In fact, you don't even get a choice. Anytime you try to use a Cab Rider command or tool, for instance, if I were to just select the clear story stick tool, it would tell me this cab rider model was created in an earlier version and needs to be updated to be compatible with this version. It is suggested that you save a backup of that current model before updating. So one of the things you might want to do at this point is just say OK without selecting yes for either of these two. Just say OK. Save your model under another archive name and then come back and do this again. And this time what I'm going to do is I'm going to say yes, I want to update the model, and I also want to update any defaults. And I will say OK. Now this takes a while, so be patient. And when it's done, it will give you this uh, message that says updating of default files has been completed and you can say OK. Now I didn't show all of that. Most of it was done offline but I can tell you that it took nearly a minute so you have to be patient. But once it's done that will never reappear. For instance if I click this again or any other cab writer Tool, you will, will not get that message. Everything's been updated and this is now a Cab Rider 4 uh, model. Okay, the very next thing we want to do here is I don't have any scenes and I'm at that point in the model where the model's complete. I'm pretty, um, I'm pretty sure I'm not going to change it. Um, I've reviewed it with my customer and everything looks good and uh, we're ready to go. So I'm going to create scenes the standard way I've always done it. Cab Rider, create basic scene set. And what I want here is I want my doors to be in the cut list scene. My draw fronts in the cut list scene. My draw boxes for the moment are going to be purchased parts. So let me say OK. And it goes about creating the scenes. Now you will notice, if you look at these in detail, you'll notice a new scene called Styles-Rails. Styles and Rails, but the uh, and sign uh, for some reason doesn't work in the scene tabs. So I've named it styles-rails. But this is a new scene that you get. This scene shows you all of the, and I'll look over here in the layers area, 
it shows you all of the back panels, base doors, base draw fronts, base end panels, base face frames, upper doors, upper draw fronts, upper end panels, upper face frames. Essentially, anything that typically has a frame and panel construction. And the reason for that is when we create cab writer production reports, we're going to get a brand new report called Styles and Rails Report. We'll deal with that in more detail in a while, but for now, just notice that you do get an extra scene. And by the way, like all scenes, you can decide what belongs in them. So if you want to subtract something or add something to this scene, you can do that. Just don't forget to update it when you do it. Okay. There are quite a few changes to Cab Writer production documentation. So let's, let's just go through that. Let's choose File, Cab Writer production documentation. Right away we get a new dialog box. Now this dialog box at the beginning gives you the same warning that you've all, always had, which is creating production documentation can take on the order of several minutes. If your outliner dialog box is open, please close it before proceeding. It can double or triple the computation time. Actually, SketchUp has made some improvements in that area, so that's not as true now as it used to be, but it still, it still increases um, the time for production documentation. So make sure you close the outliner if it's open. But now there's some other things here. Units format. Notice we can choose the format we want to output things in, imperial or metric. We can have a measurement multiplier, which I'll explain at a later date. And we can change that to anything we want from 1 to 10 to 100 to 1,000 to 10,000. And display units, yes or no. And restore units yes or no. Now let me explain this. There are some CAM packages. This applies only to people who are going to export DXF files. There are some CAM packages that require things either in metric or in, in imperial units. And you may be working in the opposite set of units. For instance, I do all of my work in imperial units. But there are some CAM packages that require DXF files be specified in metric. So what I can do as a user, an imperial user, is I can produce my documents in metric. And if I do produce them in metric, I'll probably want to say no on the units because metric dimensions become pretty long in terms of the numbers of characters, um, and that can create problems when producing cut lists and printing them out. So typically, um, if I were working in metric, I would say no units. And then I would probably say yes to restore units because what that would do is after all of the cab writer production documentation is created, it will revert back to what I typically work in, which is imperial units with display units displayed. So it's just a quick way to allow you to switch to another type of unit and if you want, have Cab Writer automatically restore what you were doing before. So I can just leave this long alone because um, I'm going to work in Imperial units in my model and also in my production documentation. So I will just leave this alone and say OK. Now, 
There's a number of changes to the production documentation dialog box. One of them right away you might notice is the style and rail report, which at the moment is pointing to the style dash rail scene, this new scene I just told you about. And we're going to go through that in detail in a few minutes. Our cut list report is going to use the cut list scene. Now I want to say something about the cut list report. The cut list report should include any part and all parts that are going to be used in other reports. For instance, if you want a styles and rails report, then make sure that styles and rails are included not only in the styles and rails scene, but included in the cut list scene. Because you need to generate uh, things like subassembly uh, information and part number. Part numbers are not part of the attributes. They're assigned when CabWriter produces the production documentation report. So make sure any parts that are going to be included in any other report are also included in whatever scene you use for the cut list report. It may not be the cut list scene. You might want to use, for instance, the perspective scene. The perspective scene has a whole bunch of stuff in it, including my crown molding and things like, well, it doesn't actually, but it could. It could include my crown molding and things like that. So whatever scene you use here, And I'm going to go back to the cut list scene. Whatever scene you use here, make sure it includes the things that are going to be in other reports. And since I'm going to produce DXF, so I have a DXF scene, and I choose that here. Now I've got two sections down here, one called Select Purchase Parts Report and Select Milled Parts Report. Purchase parts can be anything from... Uh, draw fronts to doors to uh, draw boxes and things like that. The only thing I'm going to purchase in this model is the draw boxes. I'm actually going to cut the... Um, I'm going to make my own draw fronts and door fronts in my shop. So that means I'm going to be milling them. So in the select mill parts report, I'm going to select a styles and rails report. And it's a pretty useful report in my mind. I'm also going to request a spreadsheet compatible cut list and a DXF by material name and thickness report or set of files actually. And you'll see in a moment that um, the types of files that are produced, um, DXF files that are produced number about four types and we'll go through those. I'm not going to use a um, cut list bridge report and you'll see why in a moment. So no cut list, I'm sorry, no cut list plus FX report and you'll see why in a moment. Now here's something over here that um, is new. Notice we now have 10 lines that where we can specify things for a label. If, for instance, we choose in this label format, if we choose a, let's say, a standard uh, a styles and rails every 5160, what that means is when the styles and rails report is generated, I'll also be able to print out labels for the styles and rails report. And again, I'm going to ask you to hold off until we describe that in detail. But nonetheless, for every part, for every style and rail that's included in the styles and rails report, we can print the label and we can print it in either 5160 format or 5163 format. If I were to choose 5160, you notice nothing's been defined yet. You also notice that these don't work. Only the first five work. 
And that's because 5160 is the small label and it only allows five lanes, uh, five lines. So we can pick the lines we want to include and it might be project name, component number. By the way, as I pick these, you'll see they show up down here and to give you an idea what this, the label is going to look like. Um, probably a description. And then maybe, um, oh, re uh, let me, how about info and, or actually tags is probably a better one here. Tags and finished dimensions or initial dimensions. Resize dimensions. Let me explain why I chose that particular five. Tags is, is a parameter that's typically used for things like choosing two styles, or, you know, two corner styles that need to be grain matched. So for those two corner styles, in the tags column, I might say grain match one. That means it's the first pair to be grain matched. I might have a grain match 10 which means it's the tenth pier to be grain matched. So those might be useful in the in the labels that are going to be stuck on those parts after they're cut. And since styles and rails are typically uh, resized in some way, usually thickness or something, um, this is the initial dimension. And you can look at the cut list for the final dimension or perhaps you want the final dimension here so that you know what to cut it down to. But in any case, my point here is that you have to define these labels. And when you do, they're stored so you can come back to them. So if I go to another label like the DXF label, I can come back to my Styles and Rails 5163 label and take a look at it. Now, if I haven't created cut lists yet, if this model is the, a brand new model and no cut list has ever been uh, produced for it, I'll get a message saying a cut list has not been produced that includes these parts. Um, that's just a warning message. You can just say OK and ignore it. Because, like I said, uh, things like component number aren't generated until a cut list is produced. So you can't create a label that includes that if the cut list hasn't been produced. So once I've defined these labels and stored them away, I um, can then use them. I can choose down here for my styles and rails. I can choose the 5163 and look at the print preview and that's what it looks like. This isn't the whole sheet, it's just a portion of the sheet. And now I can print those using the print labels button. Okay, so now I've selected everything I want here. I'm going to generate the cut list and all of the other documentation. All I need to do is say create reports and be patient. Okay, so the, all of the reports are finished and it um, tells me where it put them. And I'll want to write that down or remember it or something. Um, but it, in, in my case, it's on my desktop under Capwriter 3 Comprehensive. Now, having said OK, notice something else pops up. It's called Sheet Optimization Settings. I'm going to leave this go for the moment. I'll come back to it. But suffice it to say at this point that CabWriter now has native sheet optimization. And we'll come back to that and explain that in a moment. So I'll just close this. 
Now I want to look at my the reports I just generated because I want to explain the styles and rails reports. I opened up the folder where all of my reports have been placed and given the selection I made for the reports I wanted created, here's the results. Notice I have this new one, styles and rails schedule.csv. It's like any other .csv. You can open it in Excel, uh, Mac numbers, or any CSV compatible um, spreadsheet. I have my traditional door and draw schedule. I have my traditional .csv uh, cut list it's called Cabrider Comprehensive 3 face frame. And I also have a folder with three types of DXF files. Now, there will be a fourth type soon, and I'll explain that later, but I just wanted to mention that there are three types now, and we'll add a fourth type here in a moment. But this is what we really want to look at, the styles and rails report. So let me open that. And I'm opening it in, um, Open Office. I could open it in Excel or what have you, but I'm opening opening it in Open Office Calc. And so right off the bat, what I have is the Styles and Rails schedule. It gives me the project name, customer name if I included it, a timestamp that it was generated. And it gives me two schedules. First, the RIP schedule. And then the crosscut schedule. The RIP schedule broken down. And let me just. Okay. The RIP schedule is broken down into rough lumber material names. And I only have one material name in this model, but if I had two, this might say rough lumber maple here, and then down here rough lumber cherry, and so on and so forth. But for each material name, it sorts things by thickness and width. So in other words, there are some parts that have a thickness of 27 30 seconds, and they have widths of 5 and 1 16th. It sums up all of the parts and calculates their linear feet. So in other words, I need six linear feet of material that is 27 30 seconds thick and 5 and 1 16th inches wide. Now here's another width, same thickness, but a different width. And I need one foot, linear foot of that. Yet Again, another width, same thickness, 13 linear feet, so on and so forth, until it runs out of this thickness. It goes to the next smaller thickness. This is the largest thickness. It goes to the next smaller thickness and looks for all of the widths with that thickness and has them here in order of largest to smallest. So we start off with 3 and 7 16 inch wide, 13 16 thickness, and I need 20, uh, 23 linear feet of that. And finally, uh, 25 30 seconds thickness and by 4 inches and 5 linear feet of that. When it's done all of that, it will tell me the total rough lumber I need. Again, here's the material name. I only need maple material in this particular model, but it'll tell me I need 63 board feet of four quarter material and 76 board feet of five quarter material. And again, the five quarter material that we're looking at here is tip is probably this material here in fact I'm sure it is 
and the four quarter material are these two thicknesses here. So this is a rough calculation of board feet by quarter thicknesses. You may want to add a little slop yourself by multiplying this by something like another 10%, like 1.1 or something. Or you might even find that this is too sloppy already. Um, but it's, a, it's an estimate to help you uh, plan your project and, and cost your project. Now you can picture yourself standing at the um, table saw with material that's 23, 27 and 30 seconds thick and setting your fence for 5 and a 16th and keep cutting until you get 6 linear feet and then setting your fence to this and keep cutting for 1 linear feet and so on and so forth. But the nice thing about this is because this is a CSV format you can export this to drive um, machines that do things like saw stop for you and what have you. In fact, that that's even more important in this next report. This is the cross cut report. So the cross cut report starts out Crosscut report starts out with all of the draw styles in rough lumber maple first. And those are thirteenth of an inch, thirteen sixteenths thick. And they have the same, all the same width, but different lengths. And again, from longest to shortest and the quantity of each that you need. Now again, this is where you can use, um, you know, a computer controlled um, stop mechanism for your chop saw. Or you can do it manually. You can set up these dim dimensions manually, but this helps you to go ahead and cut these things fairly rapidly and count the number you need. Once the draw styles are completed, the draw rails, And then finally, the door styles and door rails. Face frame styles, face frame rails. And so these can be stacked up in piles. And you can print out labels, like I said before. And the labels will have the dimensions on them, so you can match them to these parts. And, you know, if you or a shop that builds a lot of your own doors and drawers, this can be pretty handy. So that's the styles and rails report. Now we want to move on to native optimization, native sheet optimization in particular. Recall that when I last did my carburetor, when I generated my carburetor production documentation, I aborted it um, before we looked at the sheet optimization. I'm going to redo cab rider production documentation. I've made some minor changes. For instance, on the cut list, I've now added the crown molding. You can see it here if I uncheck it and bring it back. You see I've included the crown molding. And that's really all the changes I made. But I want to redo the production documentation and this time carry it all the way through. We won't recover information we've already talked about, but nonetheless, we'll go through the process. So let me go to File, Carburetor Production Documentation. I'll just say OK. And Let's see if I want to make any changes here. No, I think everything's good. So let me just do this again. 
Okay, so my production documentation has been created, and I'm not going to go relook at that, but I'm going to hit OK. And remember, this dialog box came up, and the last time I simply closed it. But now I want to explain what it is. This is the sheet optimization settings. There's a few things we want to look at here. First, up here is a material name and grain style. What this is all about is for all of the material names that you have in your sheet list, in your um, sheet goods list, you have to choose whether or not it has grain. MDF does not have grain. It's just whatever color, white. Baltic birch does have grain, and so on and so forth. So whatever materials you're using in your project, you have to make sure that you've included whether or not it has grain. The other thing you want to do is, let me cherry, uh, Pre-finished cherry. You have to define the formats that you're going to use for that type of material. And in this case, I've got two types of cherry plywood pre-finished, and I have both one half inch and three quarter inch by 48 inches wide by 96 inches long. Now. Cabrator will tr attempt to do this automatically and fill this out for you automatically. And it'll be based on... Oops, that's wrong. That should be three quarters. It'll be based on the default sheet format. So down here, my default sheet format is three quarters of an inch thick, 48 inches wide, 96 inches long, and has grain. So it will make an attempt at creating these for you automatically. The thickness will come from the thick, thickness of the actual sheet. The width and length will come from the defaults and it'll supply these and automatically try to create them. If they don't, if it's not created and if something's missing, you need to add it. You can add a line Suppose I want some 5 8 inch uh, material. So I would just type in 5 8 48, 96. And that'll be saved. Now I can go look at some other material like just plain old cherry plywood. I've got nothing in there. But if I go back to Cherry Plywood Pre-Finished, I've got all formats and noticed it's reorganized it in terms of um, its thickness. So you can delete any of these lines, by the way. But to delete them, you have to first choose them and then hit Delete Line. And now that's been deleted. Now, this list, I want to make sure you understand what this list is. This material name list is exactly the same list. If I go to extended, uh, extended entity info and look at the lists and go to sheet good, that's the same list that I'm looking at over here. So to change that list, if I want to add a material here in my project that doesn't show up here, I simply go to this list and add the material right here using the add icon. Okay, so now I've set all this up and Cab Writers helped me do that. Now what I want to do is tell it how I want my sheets optimized. I have a general optimization setting here. 
And the first thing it says is, what do I, what do I want to do with uh, if for sheets that have no grain? For instance, MDF. Should I be allowed to rotate them? And I'm going to answer yes here. The reason is, if it doesn't have grain, what do I care which direction it uses as the length and width? It really doesn't matter. I can tell it to ignore grain direction even if it has grain. Now, I've said no here because I don't want to do that. But suppose you're going to use a plywood, um, I don't know, like birch that has grain, but you're going to paint it so you don't care about the grain. So if I tell it yes, ignore the grain direction and, and, and optimize it as best you can, you may save yourself plywood. But for this project, I'm going to answer that no. And now we're going to talk about the CNC milling. And the first thing it wants to know is what is the edge margin? Well, if you're cutting things on a CNC machine, you know that the edges of plywood can be beat up. And so you want to waste a certain amount of plywood just to make sure that you're cutting into good plywood or milling good plywood. So what this says here is on all four edges, we won't use the first one quarter inch. Okay, that's the edge margin. Now there's a cutter bit that you're going to use for cutting pieces out in a sheet of plywood. And that cutter bit in our defaults is 3 8 of an inch. We want a clearance because if we're cutting, let's say, piece A, and the bit comes along and cuts the top side of piece A, but piece B is uh, next to piece A, we don't want the bottom side of piece B to be cut without a clearance because you may, you may not get perfect cuts. Instead, what you want is a clearance, a little bit of a clearance between the cutter bit edge, the off edge, the, in other words, the side of the cutter bit that is not being cut, and the adjacent part. We want a clearance there, so that's what this clearance is. Now I can choose how I want to cut this. And for CNC machines, you don't want to worry about rip cuts versus cross cuts. You just want the optimum. Now, there may be cases where you do want to worry about rip cut versus cross cut, but for the moment, let's ignore that and choose optimum. We want it to give us the, the best optimization it can. So now let's talk about how we cut things on the table and panel saw. Again, the edge margin is how much along the edges, the four edges I'm willing to waste to make sure I get a good edge. The saw curve might be one eighth of an inch or three thirty seconds. And again, I want there to be a little bit of a clearance between the edge that I'm cutting and any parts that might be next to it. And again, I use the one eighth inch clearance. Now, if I have both a table saw and a panel saw, I might want to choose as a nesting direction something like rip cut. And what that will do is it'll optimize the sheets such that the first major cuts are in the lengthwise direction and indicating that I'm going to make those first cuts on a table saw. And then my secondary cuts will be made on a panel saw, or vice versa. If I'm going to make my first cuts on a panel saw, I would choose cross cut. So my major primary cuts would be across the grain, and that's what I would cut on a panel saw. Uh, you may be doing both on a panel saw, and so maybe you simply want optimum since you can rip and, and cross cut. Anyway, 
that's what this is all about. So once I've chosen that, and you'll find that typically you'll never change these because you probably use the same settings for every, every project. So you'll only have to set them up once more than likely. All right, so let's say begin optimization. All right, there we are. We've been optimized. And what we're looking at here is the cut list diagrams for a simple table saw or, or, or panel saw optimization. Now notice we chose the optimum. And what that means is it will choose whether it, it the initial cuts are rip or cross cut based on the best fit. So if you look at this, you might notice that the first cut might be a rip cut here, all the way down. That's not true here. You won't find a rip cut where you can go all the way down, but you will find cross cuts that you can go all the way down. So it depends on how it gets the best fit. And so, like I said, if you're cutting these on a table or panel saw, you might actually want to choose cross cut or rip. If you don't and you choose optimum, you will get whatever is the best fit. And you'll see, if we look over here, we'll see that the total number of sheets are 22 sheets. It had to place 216 instances and it was successful in placing all 216 of the 216. These were the, this is just a, um, you know, a, a um, results that indicate what the setups were. The setups were that it has grain, yes. Can you rotate grainless? Yes. Ignore grain? No. Edge margin one quarter, saw kerf one eighth, and clearance one eighth. You will notice around the edges here, there's one quarter inch around all edges, a minimum of a quarter of an inch. And between, there is a one eighth cut plus a one eighth clearance, so you'll have a one quarter inch distance between parts. All right, so now let's look at some of the details of this. What might strike us right off the bat is some are blue and some are yellow. What does that mean? Yellow parts are parts that have been rotated so that they make good use of the plywood. Now, I can choose any part here, and when I do, it will highlight the line of the cut list. You'll notice that when I highlighted this one, it says I cannot rotate it. But if I highlight this one, it says, yes, that could be rotated. So the this is just a simple way of letting you know that some parts have been rotated such that their length and width have been swapped. Let's move along here. Now, you'll notice up here material format. In this project, I've used three quarter inch thick maple plywood pre-finished, one half inch thick maple plywood pre-finished, three quarter inch thick shop plywood, three quarter inch ship uh, thick maple plywood, one quarter inch thick maple plywood, and one half inch thick maple plywood. So I can choose any one of these and it will show me the optimization for that particular format. So the one and a half inch material, 48 by 96, this is the optimizations for that. And the more material you have, the more instances you have, the better results you'll get here. You'll see some white areas here that couldn't be used. Um, but there's only nine sheets involved here and only 39 instances to choose from. Whereas 
if I go back to the original one, there was 216 instances to choose some from, so it packed it pretty tight. And only when you get down to the last one is there a lot of white space. So the optimization does a really good job the more parts you have to pack. But again, each one of these, each one of these formats, if I look at the shop plywood, you'll notice the shop plywood is nothing but a bunch of ties uh, and ribs for the Tokek. So each of these formats you can take a look at. Let's go back to this one. All right, so this is the cut list for anything that is three quarters of an inch thick, 48 inches, uh, that's going to be on material that's 48 inches by 96 inches, and the name is maple plywood pre-finished. So for that set of combinations, this is the cut list. And I can scroll down and look at the entire cut list. Or I can choose any one of the lines by simply clicking on one of the parts. Now, I can display these with the description and part number, as I've done here. So notice this is part number C19-4, and then the description of the part, or the part name, the component name, right here. I can use just the description. Now notice there's no part number. I can use just the part number right here. Or I can use the subassembly, which I don't find terribly useful and not clear that anybody will use it, but you might for some reason want all of your parts labeled with just the subassembly. Let me go back to this. Now I can show the dimensions of the part by clicking this dimensions here. And the way you read this is the long dimension is shown here in the upper left hand corner. And you notice it's printed in the long dimension. This is the width printed in the vertical dimension down here in the lower right hand corner. In rotated parts, you'll notice that the long dimension is in the lower left-hand corner and printed in the long dimension. And the width is printed horizontally. And you can see that here. All right, so that's the dimensions. If you choose info and banding, now I don't have any parts with any banding information right now. But if I did, this would show me the info information like it's showing me right here. Then there would be two vertical pipelines and followed by the banding information. It'll tell me what type of banding to use. So it'll give me two pieces of information when I choose this if I had anything in the banding column. Those would appear here. This is a summary report. Again, it tells you the initial conditions, the number of instances that you wanted to place and how successful you were. If it couldn't place an instance or more, it would show that instance right here in red. It'd say this, you know, it would say something like, you know, it placed 214 of 216 instances, and then it would show you the instances that didn't get placed. That might happen, for instance, if you have a toe kick, um, you know, rib that is, or something, a toe kick part that's longer than 96 inches and can't fit on a sheet of plywood. It would indicate that right here. And then it goes on to tell you the efficiency of each sheet, how efficient the layout was. In other words, this one says it used 96% of the sheet and wasted only 3.8. Now, 
those will not add up necessarily to 100%. They do in this particular case, but they won't necessarily add up to 100%. And so for each of the 22 sheets, you have statistics. The other thing you can do now in Cab Rider 4 is for each of these, for each one of these formats, you can get a sheet preview. This is a summary page, and again, it's this information right here on the summary page, so you know the conditions. It will tell you the project name, the number of sheets, and the date, and it'll start with the format. This was maple plywood pre-finished three quarters by 48 by 96. And then it'll start the cut list. This is the cut list for that format, that format only. And then followed by the actual diagrams. And in this case, I think we had 22 sheets um, plus seven sheets of cut list plus one um, overview sheet so there was 29 sheets overall and those can be printed and all you have to do to print them is say sheet print and then you get the print dialog box and you can go from there you can also print them into a PDF if you want and and put them in a PDF file and print them later. Um, one reason you may want to do that, by the way, is you may want to print a PDF file for this set of conditions. Then change these conditions and print another one, and then you, you might do that two or three times for two or three different sets of conditions and um, you know make a choice as to what you want to do. Okay. The other thing you can print with this dialog box is the labels. I'm going to choose a label format. Now remember these label formats I created back when I first opened up production documentation on the very first dialog box. Or maybe it was the second dialog box, but it's, it's where we created the um, various label formats and the one I'm going to choose here is the cut list Avery 5163 which is the large one having chosen that I can look at my label preview and notice it is the large one there's almost 10 lines or maybe there are 10 lines 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 yep the first line will always be bolded and the purpose of that is you might want to choose a heading that um, will tell you the most information or will be the thing you're trying to look for first. The next second line will be all will be italicized. So again, you might want to put something there that's your secondary piece of information. So for in this case, PN stands for project name. This is Cab Writer 3 Comprehensive. This is part C174. I'm sorry, C17. Now I want to say something about how these are printed. This is the first sheet, sheet one of this material. Notice the part number down here is C17, and that's the first label. The next label is part. C12. Notice that's this part right here. Now I can't see the third part over here because this is only a partial printout. But notice this is C64. And here's C64 right here. So these are printed out in the way that they're laid out so that it, as you're cutting these on either the table saw or the CNC machine, you can 
stand there with your stack of labels and peel them off one at a time and stick them on the parts. And so they're ordered in the way they're placed on sheets. In fact, you'll notice the sheet number can even be on there. Notice this is all sheet one. Let me print this. Label preview, label print, PDF, print, and I'll put it on my desktop and call it test. It says there's one there already, but I'll overwrite it. Okay, so here's the printed out um, sheets. And again, you'll notice this is sheet one, sheet one, sheet one, all the way down till finally sheet two. Sheet one, sheet two. And within sheet one, all of these parts will be printed out in the order that they appear on the page. Remember again that there was C17, C12, C64, C62. So let's look at that. C17, C12, C64, C62. So they're laid out that way and you just peel them off the stock and put them on the on the sheet. Okay, so I can close this dialog after I've looked at each and every one of these, and I may want to print out each and every one of them. You probably don't want to print out sheet plywood, shop plywood rather, because you're probably getting your shop plywood from scrap pieces, but nonetheless, you could. And so for each one of these you print out, you'll get labels with it. Notice on the shop plywood, this red, it only laid out 88 of 90. And that's because these two ties are longer, in my model, are longer than 96 inches. And so I couldn't lay them out. Now I can do a couple of things about that. I can go back and make cut those ties in the model to a smaller dimension. And I'll have more parts, but they'll all fit. And I can come back and reproduce my carburetor documentation. Um, but I'm not, I'm not going to worry about that right now. All right, so once I've dealt with all of the sheets that I want to um, cut on the table saw or panel saw, I can close this, and I can close it either by closing down here or closing up here. No matter how I close it, if I have sheets that I want to cut on the CNC machine, I'll see those next. Now in this particular project, what I did was I put things on the cut list and also on the DXF scene. So both scenes have the same sheet material. So I've got duplicate plots here, which isn't what I'd normally do, but I just wanted to do that for demonstration purposes. Typically, I'd, I'd want to put on the cut list what I'm going to cut on my table saw in on the DXF what I'm going to cut on the CNC machine. All right, so again, this is the same, although this time you'll notice that we've got the holes. And um, we don't have, um, this is all butt joints. So we don't see any joinery here, but if, if we had mortises um, or tongues or something like that in grooves, you would see those here as well. I don't happen to have those in this project. But notice this is the sink stretcher, the front sink stretcher that's been cut to allow for the sink to sit in. And notice that shape is there as well. So the actual shapes are here in this in the um, CNC plots so that you can see if they're actually producing the correct DXF files. But otherwise everything's the same. I can choose the formats
and look at the optimized sheets and what have you. Um, here's a back that's too big. Now that one I would have to fix. There's something about that that um, I would either have to cut that out of the table saw. Uh, well, that wouldn't be possible either. It would probably come up red on the table saw. But that's a, that's a cabinet I'd have to fix somehow. So, otherwise, this is the same. Um, so, again, you can, you can choose the labels you want to print. In this case, I need to select DXF labels. And I would select the big part, probably. And I could do the label preview, same thing. And again, they're printed out in the, in the order that they're going to be cut on the machine. Now, there's one other thing we need to cover about sheet optimization. Uh, that is CNC milling and sheet optimization. Is the layer naming for the DXF files that will be produced. Let me just look real quick at the DXF files. Remember before when we went into this folder, we had three folders. Now we have a fourth one. And this fourth one is the sheet folders. So for every material name and format, so this is but uh, maple plywood pre-finished, and if I extend this, maple plywood uh, pre-finished half inch 48 by 96. So for every material name and format, there's a folder. This is the maple plywood pre-finished three quarter 48 by 96. This was a half by 48 by 96. And this is plain maple plywood three quarter 48 by 96. And so for each one, there's a folder. And in the folder are individual sheets. Now, there should be 22 sheets here, and there are. If I look down here, there's 22 items in this folder. That's the number of sheets that were required to um, produce this, this material type and format. And if I click on one of these real quick, you get a very quick view of what that sheet looks like. This is another application that I use for very quick reviews by looking at the file. So I can go to any one of these and get a quick view of what that file looks like. But that's one sheet of plywood, each one of these. And the reason that they didn't appear before was because until you do the actual optimization, these files aren't produced. So the, they only get produced after the optimization, this set of files right here. All right, now, one of the things um, you need to do before you produce production documentation and before you produce the optimization is you should go, go into your defaults and again, this is something you'd probably set up one time and not set up for each and every um, each and every project. But you go to the CNC tab and notice that the layer naming has changed. One of the changes is there used to be one layer for the drill. And things that were drilled all the way through or through drills or things that were only drilled in like shelf holes, uh, maybe a half inch in a three quarter inch piece of plywood, are called drill partial. So holes that are only partially through the plywood would now be on the drill partial layer. And things that are drilled all the way through would be on the drill through layer. And this roughly means that the partial layer is the shelf holes and the through layer are the construction holes, roughly speaking. We still have the small outside profile and the large outside profile layers, the inside profile layer, the pocket layer, 
And you can now name the substrate. You can give the substrate your own name. And if you want, you can include nothing or include the thickness in the substrate name and any other letters or names that you want to apply appending to the substrate. And there's also a default down here called measurement multiplier. The idea here is that you can put codes in here that represent instructions to the CAM program and ultimately instructions to the CNC machine to tell it how to do tool pathing. And that's very, very CAM software specific. I'm not going to demonstrate that here. I'm not going to tell you what that is. But if you're working on a BSE machine, there will be a very thick manual that tells you what codes to use and how to organize them. And we've just provided the layers and this measurement multiplier that allows you to do that. What this does is for every thickness or any other dimension you have here, it will multiply it by some multiplier. Now the default is one, so it won't change anything. So if your thickness was 0 0.375, it will come out 0 0.375. But if you put a multiplier in here of, let's say, 10,000, which is four decimal points, it will take something like 0 0.75 and make it 7,500. Makes it a little easier to read, perhaps, on a file name or, or a layer name. But that's specific to the CAM program itself. So you may want to change some layer naming information between optimizations you might have forgotten to do something and you have to do it again so you don't have to go through the production documentation all over again what you can simply do is with the same production documentation you can go to file cut list bridge sheet optimization and now you can change conditions. So for instance, suppose I want a half inch on the edges. In both cases. Notice my edges now have a half inch and instead of 22 sheets of plywood notice I now need 23 sheets of plywood simply by making that a half inch but my point here is simply that you can change any of the any of the defaults in on the um, CNC setup any of these defaults can be changed and you can redo the optimization over and over and all it takes is a simple click of sheet optimization and I believe that this is the end of this video we're about an hour and ten minutes so let's end and we'll pick up in part two have a good day